This is George Skaka, and you're listening to the New York Fishing Podcast. For those of you that have listened to me in the past, I talk a lot about fisheries management. This is in reference to breaking news that happened this week that's kind of gone under the radar. And that is that the uh, Juvenile Striped Bass Index in Maryland is showing a really bad trend. There's no... There's no getting around it. Uh, That fishery in the Chesapeake is witnessing some of its uh, toughest times. For those of you that listen to this podcast, you know, I often say there's one thing that's missing in every piece and part of fisheries management, and that's common sense. There's just, there's no common sense in any of it. And I'm going to show you just a little bit about that right here and now. I can't get to, I'm not going to get really too deep and get into ASMS and all these different acronyms because it's probably 50 or 100 of them. I'm going to try and lay it out in layman's terms for those of you striped bass fishermen who want to fish for striped bass next year. Because what's being discussed behind closed doors right now, and actually some of the doors are open, and that's uh, what's got me very concerned, is a total moratorium, uh, probably until sometime in June. Total. No catch and release, no targeted fishery whatsoever. Being that they label us uh, a 9% mortality rate, which I'm going to just touch Uh, in a few minutes, because that number, again, if you put a little bit of common sense behind it, you know the number is incorrect, yet it's still being used. So when I when I talk about common sense, first thing I want to talk about is the striped bass fishery, uh, the entire management plan. And in fact, this goes for just about every single fishery there is, or every heavy commercially fished fishery. And that would be, we regulate these fish in pounds, not fish. So I want you to think about that for a minute. Do we, as recreational anglers, care like about pounds of fish? Do we count our overall pounds of fish or do we care about the size of each individual fish we catch? And what does pounds got to do with fish? I mean, isn't it the number of fish we're trying to save? I never got it. I'm sure I, I got to be missing something, but no one has ever explained to me why all of these fisheries where we're trying to, when we look at young of the year indexes, we're looking at numbers. We're not looking at pounds, yet then we turn around, we take those numbers, we extrapolate numbers, we we make it harder to predict what's going to happen. And, you know, and then then we spit out these crazy management uh, regulations. So the, you know, one of the things that's always bugged me and it's always going to until it's addressed and it should be addressed and I'm really not sure why it's not. Um, and that is the uh, bycatch mortality of 9%, which is, uh, you know, they claim that the fish that we catch, right, every striped bass, just so you understand what this means, you catch a striped bass, you let it go, nine, uh, one out of 10 or 9%, are going to die. So it's a little under one out of 10. I have been pushing that back. It was a study. Let, let me tell you. Where's, now, look, here's the common sense. Think about it. So that study was done. I don't know. It was 19, like 95 that that study uh, was done on catch and release. Think about what the fishery was in 1995. Most, many of you guys weren't even fishing it then or gals. You weren't even uh, uh, fishing for striped bass back then. I mean, I was. And I could tell you it was 
It was a lot different than it is today. You did everything you could do to catch a striped bass. I mean, you would use live blackfish. It was legal. Back in the old, it was probably before the 90, they might have made that illegal. I, I don't know the exact dates, but back in the old day, that's what we did. We used every tactic under the sun. Remember, we didn't have the electronics we have today. So, you know, uh, we did what we had to do to catch fish. It was all legal within the law. But let's face it, there were a lot of gut hook fish. There were, you know, there was clam chumming, which, as we all know, uh, what that uh, turns into. So over the years, we were educated and we became very uh, cognizant of the fact that striped bass needed to be taken care of when we release them. You just can't catch them and give them a, you know, a double backflip when you throw them back in the water. So people started realizing that. And then, you know, I owned a fishing magazine for 30 some odd years. So I know what anglers were doing. And I've been here and lived through this change. No one could tell me it didn't happen. It happened. So back then, we'll say, okay, it's 9%. I still don't even believe those those tests, but that's okay. Uh, for the sake of argument, all right, it showed uh, it showed 9%. Now, again, I'm making this story short. I'm sorry if it sounds long, <laughs> but it's, I'm making it short. So, you know, the internet is a great thing, and the introduction of AI is another great thing, and it manages to find things for you that are very hard to find. Yet, I somehow found this study that was conducted, it was a 1,300 fish study, 1,300 fish caught in all different water temps, and this was down in Maryland, and these were striped bass, and they were targeted by J-hooks, and then they were targeted by circle hooks, something that we have today. We use circle hooks, obviously. It showed that deep hooking was reduced by 81%. 81% over the J-hook on a gut fish, on a gutted fish. It showed that there was a 76% reduction in mortality. So, okay, so now that's like two, three, I don't know. I don't even know what it is, but every percentage point, one point is a huge number. It's a huge number. I mean, if you look at this, they're always like... Every chart you see, they make sure to put the recreational fishing release mortality number in there. And it's always huge, but it's not right. Sorry, I got to calm down. Uh, It's incorrect. Whether that's intentional, I don't know. But it is incorrect. Literally, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. And it said that bigger fish were more likely to be deep hooked. The odds of dying were 15 times higher if the striped bass was hooked with a J hook. So last week, if you listened to uh, my podcast with John McMurray, and if you haven't, you probably should. Uh, he, you know, he knows striped bass well. He and I, uh, we've been around, you know, the ups and downs of this fishery. And, you know, we, we discuss various, various things about the fishery. You're definitely going to want to hear uh, that piece of it. So anyway, no one listens to this, what I'm telling you right now. I'm beating a dead horse. I have discussed this over and over and over. And this is just top of the iceberg. There, I found over 14 studies that showed the use of circle hooks with bait on striped bass have reduced mortality in those fisheries by 85%. Now, I'm bringing that up because we use them. And you know what we got for that? Gots. We got balls. That's what, that's what we got. Okay? They gave us, they give us nothing. And as John McMurray pointed out last week, it's because... They claim they don't have a data point. Maybe they don't. I don't know. Maybe this study was, I don't know. I mean, it's literally, I got it on the, it's called the Recreational Catch and Release Mortality Research in Maryland. It's from the state of Maryland. 
I got a DNR Maryland.gov. So this is their stuff. But okay, so forget about common sense with uh, how today the mortality rate's got to be down over the last, I don't know, was it 18 years? You think we've been, uh, we have a different ethic now? I can remember when striped bass were gaffed and released. In fact, they had to, uh, you know, they had to put a regulation in on that. I'm not saying it was all great and I never did it, but people did. It wasn't illegal. And, I, I, you know, they would lip gap them and all, but even still, you don't see any of that stuff anymore. So I, I don't buy that number, and, but that's a number we're stuck with for now. So here's another thing. So here you are, you're trying to save this fishery. And all of a sudden, last year, there is an emergency, dire emergency. We have to go to 28 to 31 inches. Essentially, what they said, but no one heard, was you're going down to a catch and release fishery because your odds of catching a 28 to 31 inch fish are probably, I don't know, 10 percent, 15 percent. Maybe. And according to the area, you're on zero percent. Zero. They're all going to be bigger. So we got all these big fish, but for some reason they want to, uh, they see this emergency. And I'm going to explain to you why that is. Next thing is I want you to take a look. We hear about the YOY in the Chesapeake, right? So I want you to take a look at the YOY in the Hudson River. Those are our fish. No one can say that any of the striped bass that are in the New York Bite in the spring are going anywhere but up the Hudson River. These are not Chesapeake fish. These are Hudson River fish. Now, look at the Hudson River chart. I believe it was 2020, 2021, that they had the fourth largest YOY. And if you look at that fishery, it is at or above target. That's in spite of the so-called slaughter that we do in the spring. But now we're hearing that's going to get all shut down. To save the Chesapeake fish. So here's my question. This is what I'm leading up to, and I hope you guys are getting it, and gals. We, here we are. Um, we're looking at the Hudson River fishery, which we don't know the number, but the majority of those fish that we catch and we fish here, and every single one of those fish in the spring are all Hudson River fish. So why can't we fish them? We've been fishing them, and the Hudson River is doing great. Are we relying now on the Hudson River to carry this entire striped bass quota? I don't know, maybe. Are we supposed to do all the heavy lifting and hard work while Chesapeake continues to allow 5 million pounds a year in striped bass commercially targeted? Even worse, over 120 million pounds of menhaden are pulled out of the Chesapeake every single year. That fishery is collapsing because it's been mismanaged. If you look at their regulations, they got an in and an out. They shut it down for a couple of weeks. But if you look at them, they have always caught whatever they wanted. I'm doing this for 30 years. I've sat at the table over and over and over. Chesapeake always gets what they want. They always have. Now, look, this is not a slight on Chesapeake anglers. I'm just saying the state has put these regs in. You guys haven't done the heavy lifting. You folks in Virginia, you're allowing all those menhaden to be pulled out of that out of that bay. And now here we go again. Common sense. Believe it or not, in the striped bass amendment that that's just that's, 
you know, came out recently, it, it's discussed, it's still on the table, that they want to transfer commercial quotas from one state to the next. You see, it's always, it's always something. Uh, to give an example of what that means, uh, let's say, well, you got New Jersey, actually, right? They, don't, they have a commercial quota that they don't take. So should they sell that then? Because it's going to be worth money. They could transfer that wherever they want. Think about that. So they're looking for more ways to take fish. At the same time, they're telling you that you are not allowed to fish. I think it's time that we seriously look at managing these fisheries differently. New York has time and again done the heavy lifting, gone out and did fought the fights that were not easy. And our commercial fishery is not five million pounds, it's a million pounds. And we don't allow or rather all the fish are tagged. So we know what's going on in the commercial fishery here. While At the same time, half of the fish coming out of Chesapeake are all going to commercial fisheries. Now, if they don't catch them, they want to, you know, transfer the quota. So New York has saved the Menhaden. You think that has something to do with why our striped bass fishery is so healthy? Come on, folks, you're on the water. How healthy are those fish that you are seeing out there? I mean, these, I've never seen so many big fish ever in all the years I'm doing this. So, yeah, so let's talk about what New York has done to make the Hudson what it is today. Number one, A, there is no commercial fishing. There are no nets. There are no gill nets. Because remember, those, that's a 50% mortality. Half the fish that are caught in a gill net that they can't keep die. And I think the number's higher, but we'll we'll, we'll leave it at that. So we don't have that. And that wasn't simple. There is no commercial fishery in the Hudson River, period. So we did that. We saved our bunker. We kept the reduction boats out of New York waters, and we saved all of our bunker. Look at what we have, whales and dolphins and more wildlife than we have ever seen. And that's because, again, we did the heavy lifting that they can't do down there. And they can't ever do it because Omega is out of Virginia. And the, the Omega is the company that owns the reduction uh, Manhattan fleet. Have you ever heard such a crazy name? Reduction fleet, like they're doing us a favor by reducing the amount of bunker. So anyhow, New York has done everything it possibly can. It was a time when we went from one fish at 36 inches to two fish at 28 inches. Many people in New York opposed it. I did also. Took a lot of heat from my advertisers. They wanted the two at 28. I felt going from one at 36 to two at 28 was a little bit crazy. And sorry to say, I was proven right later on. All the states had to back down to one fish at 28. But we fished on one fish at 28 when the rest of the entire coast fished it too. We did the heavy lifting on our own. And now we're being penalized for it. Now they're expecting the Hudson River fishery to carry this entire mess that they created. I think it's time to split this thing up. Yeah, there's some intermingle. Yeah, some of them do. But we don't know what that number is. I mean, there's guesstimates out there, but there's no real hard studies on that. I I just don't see what closing our spring fishery will do to help the Hudson River YOY. 
It will do nothing. Nothing. Their YOY is going to continue to go down because just take a look. Go to nyangler.com. I don't want to get into it right now. Uh, it's because they have like the most convoluted regulations you ever seen in your life. They can fish up to a 35-inch fish in the spring. Maybe now they can't because of the emergency regs, but these guys have an angle for everything. You know, they close a couple weeks here and a week there. And, you know, I mean, they're still fishing 19-inch fish. They've been doing this forever, forever. Just a few years ago, they went to their to the commission. See, this is why I don't get this. And they managed to get go from a 20-inch fish to a 19-inch fish saying that they're using circle hooks now. It's amazing how they listen to them then, but they're not giving us any credit for uh, what we're doing. So listen, everyone, you need to take this seriously because this is for real. And I've been telling you for a long time that this was coming. We kind of, a lot of people in the know felt this was coming. Is it fair? I don't believe it's fair. A lot of people don't like my attitude of uh, trying to get as many fish as I can for the recreational fishery. You see, I always felt and I still feel to this day and will always feel uh, that recreation, if, as long as a fishery is in the hands of the recreational fishery, uh, fishermen, it will be fine. Because we do whatever we have to do to sustain that fishery. We don't want to overfish it. We don't want to kill fish needlessly. We have changed our ethics 100% from 1996 until now. I hope regulators are listening. I know some of them are. Take a look at the charts. I'm sure you see them. I don't know why no one else is speaking about this. The Hudson River fishery is golden. The temperatures in the spring are the coldest they are all year. And every catch and release study proves that fish survive much longer in cooler temperatures. That is the number one factor in mortality rate, catch and release mortality rate, is water temperature. That much I agree with them on. Kind of makes sense, right? Use common sense, hot water. Okay, yeah, the fish is going to stress more. This is spring. Those waters are freaking, you don't want to fall in, I'll tell you that much, because it'll be awfully freaking cold. Don't shut us down. Guys and gals, you need to stay on top. If you care about striped bass fishing at all and the future of striped bass fishing, you need to listen to this. What I'm telling you, stay on top of it. However you do that, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, WhatsApp, whatever the hell you're using, I'd hope you go to NewYorkAngler.com because we will give you the facts and keep you up to date on everything that's happening behind the scenes. Well, last thing I'm going to do uh, before I run right now is give two minutes on the saltwater fishing license in New York. I can tell you right now that there is uh, there's not a great appetite for this license. We've been keeping our own record of how anglers are replying to the survey, you know, those that have filled out a survey and have responded to us in our questionnaire. And it does seem like it's slanted pretty heavily towards no license at all. I guess New Yorkers have had it with fees. But this is going to take a huge effort, organized effort, and those of you folks in the fishing industry, you know you're going to be affected the most by this, and the average angler, we're all going to be affected by it. I'll tell you this, stay, you know, stay in touch with us here at nyangler.com and the New York Fishing Podcast. 
And we're going to keep you up to date on what's happening with this license. And there is going to be an organized effort to knock this thing down. It's uh, being handled right now behind the scenes. The New York fishing industry, tackle shops, party boats, charter boats, and everyone selling tackle and bait and wholesalers are organizing as I speak to stop this license from moving forward. That's a wrap, folks. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to check out myangle.com and subscribe to this podcast so you can stay up to date on everything that's happening here in New York waters. Thank you for listening to the New York Angler Podcast. You can find more on fishing New York waters at nyangler.com, your secret spot online.